hi everybody and welcome from Frankfurt in Germany. My name is Katharina and I'm very excited and honored to be your host today. So welcome to the API Innovation Summit 2022, powered by Commerzbank and the API Banking Cluster. This is our third summit already. I can't believe how fast the time is going. But whereas the other summits have been complete remote events, today we have something special. This is the first hybrid event we have. So about 40 participants are here with me in Frankfurt in the tech quartier, breathing in all that startup and fintech flair. So I'm happy to have you here. But even a lot more participants are with us via our live channel. So I'm very happy to have you all on board and welcome. As you all know, our topic for today is customer value generating services, business impact of API and open banking. We did have a longer title, but we decided to go with the shorter and catchy one. Jokes aside, we are really, really happy that you're here today, and we're also very happy about this topic. As you might already know, some of our previous events, we were always looking for a topic that has somehow a connection between IT and a business perspective. So the first summit was about open banking and the future of collaboration for corporate for corporate banking. Last year, we talked about ecosystems and circular economy. And so this year, the focus will be on impact of data and how to generate true customer value. And here we see a huge, huge benefit this year as everything we do, not only as Commerzbank, but especially also from our IT perspective, should be used to benefit our customers, of course. Basis for this topic was also a white paper that we published a few weeks ago together with our cooperation partner, the Business Institute St. Gallen. Welcome, Steffi and Benjamin. And this, top, uh, this white paper was about data strategy and connected business models. And this white paper also captures some of the basic ideas we had and that will be discussed today. So if you're interested in further background information, um, yeah, this would be a good way to start. You can find this white paper on our developer portal, but I will show you that later on again. Of course, as any well-prepared summit, we also do have an agenda. This is not only good for you, but also for me, as it helps me to moderate you through this evening. Today's ag agenda is based on two different topics. So first of all, mastering data for higher business impact, and secondly, creating services based on customer needs. Both topics will be introduced by a short keynote, followed by a panel discussion with some super cool and interesting people, at least so I've heard. The closing lies in the hands of Christoph Behrensen, Head of API and Open Banking at Commerzbank, who will give us a strategic outlook in some, in some insights into what we as a bank and as an API cluster are currently working on. And then the two hours will already be over. One more thing regarding the panel discussion is that, of course, we also want to have your insights and your questions. So you will be able, um, in front of the cameras, you will be able to use Slido in order to submit your questions. And for everybody here in the room, we will have a microphone cube that you may catch. This will be actually quite interesting because one of my biggest flaws is the inability to throw objects across a room. But I will give it a try and I hope not to destroy anything. I have one more um, suggestion for you. I would kindly ask you to turn off your phones or at least put them on mute that we do not have any ringtones here. So that would be great. Thanks a lot. Before we dive right into the first keynote, and the discussion, we do have a few short welcoming words from our COO, Jörg Oliveri de Castillo Schulz. So, unfortunately, he can't join us here today in person, but we're more than happy to have him on the screen here with us. So, let's get started and listen to Jörg. So, hello and welcome, Jörg. Thanks, Katarina. Hello and welcome to the API Innovation Summit 2022. 
This is the first summit to be held in person and remote. Unfortunately, I am not able to make it there in person this time. Sorry for that. But I'm glad about the opportunity to participate at least this way. What is this summit about? The topic for today is how to create digital services with added value. You will also talk about business models based on these services. And you'll see how data caters to all this. Why is this so important for Commerce Bank? Our goal is to become the digital advisory bank in Germany. Here, of course, customer value plays an essential role. According to our digital strategy, we are making technology a driver for our future business. We are involved in open banking initiatives and are developing use cases regarding, for instance, embedded finance as well as digital ecosystems. In my eyes, this summit, therefore, adds another important piece to the puzzle. What's the role of data in this context? As a precondition for improving the customer experience, we need to develop two things. First, leverage consented data in a safe and secure way, which basically means implementing a data strategy. And second, make use of this data with the help of associated partners and, of course, API technology. So, what's left to say? If you want to be part of this collaboration, or if you are interested in learning more about customer value and business use of data, I would like to encourage you to participate in this discussion. I wish you all an exciting summit 2022 Enjoy and see you soon. Thanks, Jörg, <laughs> for sharing your thoughts. I hope next year we can repeat the summit and then hopefully everybody will be here, including Jörg. So let's see. <laughs> but I don't want to keep you waiting any longer from our first speaker. So let's move on to the first part, mastering data for higher business impact. Our first speaker will be techie and process automation enthusiast Bernd Rücker, founder and chief technologist of the process automation software vendor Camunda. So please, Bernd, if you would join me here up on stage, I will Happy leave. <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you, Katharina. Okay. Yeah, then um, welcome. Soon enough, we might get a slide with a clicker, probably. Yeah, awesome. That's me. Um, so data is the new oil. I think that's one of the um, headlines everybody knows, in a way. That's some of the thoughts that are driving a lot of people, in a way. Okay, data is the new oil. And I was thinking about that a little bit in preparation for today. And I was thinking around, like, okay, we have data and oil. It seems to be valuable, right? But if I... If I look at oil, where is, where is the value in oil? So oil, for example, is not eatable, it's not drinkable, I cannot swim in that very well. So oil seems to be not that valuable on its own, but of course there's a lot of usage for oil out there. You could whatever, drive your car, you could heat your building, you can do a lot of other things where you unleash the energy that's within the oil. And that's actually the valuable thing, not the oil on itself. So. Um, I find that important to think about that because nowadays there is a lot of, let's say, emphasis on, on data, on data strategy, on data fabric, on data whatever. So a lot of talk about data. But if we keep the analogy looking at data as kind of the oil, then I find it important also to look at the action. And in a way, the data is fueling the action. That makes a lot of sense. Without the oil, the car can drive, if we stick with that metaphor for a second. Um, maybe we need other data in order to support that. That might be whatever, the fuel station. It might be a map that's uh, in order to know where I'm driving at. So there's a lot of data involved to make the action happen. That's true for sure. But um, yes, and of course, there's analytics. And um, from my perspective, that's 
one of the things people think of. If I say data, if I say whatever, data lake, a lot of data, and we have data everywhere, most people think of analytics, make sense of the data, make some whatever, make it visible as a dashboard, as this nice speedometer or gosh, or something I can look at in order to understand my data. Um, and that's an important use case. Um, I try to make the point that's not, only, not the only important thing here to look at. So even if I have the analytics, for example, I know my, my gas tank is empty. I need to do something about that. And I find that, again, the action sometimes even more important. And that's about processes. And I come back to that in a second while I'm talking about processes here. So just to make one example, if you want to refuel that, that car because we run out of, out of um, oil is not the right thing here, but out of fuel, that's kind of a process. It means it's a multi-step thing. I need to do a couple of tasks in a row. I need to think about, do I refuel it now? Where is the next gas station? How do I get there? Then I go at the gas station. I need to park the car there. I might pick up the thing here. Hopefully, that has a proper API so it fits into my car. It might be a standardized thing. So hopefully, that works. And then I have refilled the car. Great. I, I executed a process. That's good because that gives me value because I can continue driving. Um, another thought here, by the way, the refueling is kind of not my end goal, right? I have to refuel the car because I want to get to somewhere from A to B. That's my real business need I'm fulfilling here. So you see the, the whole ecosystem with the data and action, it's, it's kind of interrelated. And I find that important to keep in mind when talking about data. Um, Katarina already introduced me very quickly, so that's my name. There's my email address. You can ask me anything you want to discuss afterwards easily. Um, I've written two books, which are, and you can guess by the title, it's called Practic Process Automation. It's real life BPMN. BPMN stands for Business Process Model and Notation. So obviously, I care about business processes in a way. I co founded a company which does open source process orchestration. So we're automating processes end to end at a lot of customers. So that's why I call myself a process orchestration enthusiast. It's kind of what I already did during my um, master's studies. I always looked at how to automate processes, how to automate these, a lot of tasks on the way um, in which order. And then for me, data is an important thing to keep in mind, but it's not kind of the core of the activity. And it's probably good to, to have that in mind. That's, that's my perspective, how I look at the topic. OK, let's make an example. And probably let's skip oil for a second. It's not the most positive topic to talk about anyway. So let's talk about bank account opening. And in use case, maybe somebody here knows, um, probably in the industry. So pretty common thing, you want to open a bank account. And let's, let's assume at the, at the bank, at the organization somewhere there, there's a service for that probably where you can onboard a new customer. And if you go there, um, maybe there's a process which is executed in the background. So that's the action. It's a multi-step thing because you have to do a lot of things like address checks or sanity checks or um, sanction checks or whatever, maybe even manual things. And of course, that's related to a lot of data which is available in the bank. So. Um, you might score the customer based on data you have about the customer, or you might influence the data. Like when you create a new customer within your core banking system, you write new data or you adjust data or whatever. So there's a lot of interaction with data. Hopefully, your APIs, I come back to that in a second. So that's kind of an important relationship here, I try to stress. So um, I try to make it very simple on that picture. So. You have an action, which is very often a process if you look in the business context, like a multi-step thing. It's very often triggered by, I called it a button. I'm a metaphor person. It's like somebody clicks a button, right? So on the website, it's very often more complicated than that. But some human wants to do something and triggers some action which normally reads, writes, or changes some kind of data. Super simple, right? Super simple, but important, um, again, to stress that, and we might come back to that in the discussion later on. There's a second thing, and sometimes I, I see that confused, which I find important is that also data can trigger actions. That's, that's the whole, we look into the data and we, we recognize something and we have to do something about it. Let's make an example again. 
And we are, I call it a data point of measurement. I'm actually, um, we're also working a lot with aviation here, for example. And like with aviation, they have these um, airplanes like in the sky and they're sending a lot of real measurements. But it's the same like in a bank, you, you have a lot of data, let's say at that point data, events, data points where, for example, I paid something with my credit card. That's a data point. It's a measurement. And we have lots of those everywhere floating around. And they, one of the first important observations is it's, it's a data point. It's not necessarily valuable again for us because, okay, I paid something with a credit card. Everybody does that all the time, all day long. So is that, is that good or bad? We don't know. So you need to have some kind of mechanism to recognize patterns, to recognize if this is good or bad. Is, is, that, is that normal day that I pay that like amount for, for a bike, for example? Is that, is that, or is that suspicious? So these whole fraud detections are there. There are certain rules at play to generate what I call insights. So that's the data, then we have to generate insights and that alone, again, is not really that valuable because, okay, we know it's suspicious, now what? We have to do something about that. So then you have an action, which sometimes is a process, but might also be something else, like locking the credit card or sending an SMS for approval or whatever. So we very often have this cycle again, like, yeah, and technology-wise, um, it might be like data streaming, Kafka is very much over there, we are very much over there, so, just to recap that. So that's for me a typical pattern. So data triggers probably an action or a button triggers an action and that changes data and so on and so forth. For me also one thing, again, the analytics. Sometimes we even have data, have reporting, a human looks at that and said, oh, we have to do something and presses a button. So it's kind of the same thing. Okay, if that's too abstract, one, one more thought. Again, opening a bank account, we hit the enter button. That might trigger a process. That might access some data. We hopefully have APIs for everything. Why is that so important? I think Riskov can talk to that later on in, in, in depth. But I made it, wanted to make one example, which I see very often. We nowadays swap more and more services by either more automated ones, cheaper ones, better ones, probably SaaS provided ones. So we might not do that like we do it today, tomorrow. So we, we need possibilities to swap out things. And therefore, we need proper APIs to do that. So for me then, the data is part of kind of the API description, but not the data itself, which is that important. Okay, and then just to make one last example, that's something I hear super often in banking at the moment. So we need to speed up things. We need to improve the customer experience. It's, we cannot longer take that long to open a bank account. Others can do that in a minute. Why does it take three days? So we want to adjust processes to make that happen. And again, for me, it's important that we understand how the process operating at the moment, what steps do we need to do? And then we can swap out steps, like for example, do an automatic approval, maybe looking at business rules, maybe looking at AI, at historic, historic data, but we wanna, wanna adjust the process to make it faster, to make it more automated. Therefore, we always have to look at the process. But why, why I'm stressing that? Because I'm a process orchestration enthusiast, okay? But um, the other part is, because I see that confused very often. Um, one thing that happens nowadays, we have that data and we say data is important and we have that constant stream of data like credit card payments and stuff. Why not do it like implement the business process of bank account opening like a stream of data? Somebody wants a new bank account, that's a piece of data, it's an event. We can put that in our infrastructure and others can react to that. Hey, there's an event, somebody wants to open a bank account so we need to get a credit check checked. And only if that is done, that writes new data to the system, which probably leads to some, some other component to do an address check, which leads to new data and so on and so forth. From my perspective, this is always a little bit like batch systems. I'm not sure if I should do that here, but um, you write something, then you have another batch doing another thing and so on and so forth. And we see that happening a lot also with data streaming, event streaming, also with Kafka architectures nowadays. And I find that very risky because if you think of it, you want to now 
adjust your business process. You want to now make it better, for example. You want to add, or you're forced to, maybe there's a legal obligation to add new checks or just things in the sequence. This gets pretty hard if you do that with pure data flowing through your system. Like, if you think of that, you now have to really go into like, okay, no, this one doesn't listen to that event anymore. That one listens to that event. You have new events. Don't want to explain it in all details, but you can. I think you can see that this gets messy very, very quickly. And this is why I find that it's so important to, to really differentiate between the data and the API. For me, an event is an API, right? And the process, the, the flow of things, what happens here, and that makes use of API services and data. So that's um, that's basically the summary where, where I was trying to get at. That's at least my opinion. Let's see what we get in the discussion. So data itself is worthless if you doesn't, don't do anything with it. Right? So the action is what, what counts. Of course, you need the data to support it. Right? So you need data, you need APIs on top of it to make it really usable. Like otherwise, you cannot put the fuel thing in your car, and you need a well orchestrated process. That's what I believe. Thank you. Let's discuss. Thanks, Ben. That's my key. Let's discuss. So first, thanks a lot for the um, interesting and quite witty insights. Um, I suggest we dive right into the first discussion, and for that I need my two panelists here up on the stage with me, and of course Bernd. So first of all, we have Dr. Eric Heinze, co-founder of the technology and market intelligence startup Coral Innovation, and Christoph Berensen, head of API and open banking at Commerzbank. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Servus. <laughs> So, Ben, you already told us that data is worthless without processes and without APIs. We love that, by the way. So, our first question is, um, how can companies prepare and process data to make it useful and accessible? Eric, would you go first? Uh, well, before we go into too much of the tech stuff, I would say um, the first step is to get your organizational culture towards data. So, we need a data culture. So, the first step is if I get if I want to use data for insights, um, I need to have trust in the data. What happened to it? What was the process, the flow? I need to be very clear of it. And um, so I need to know that everybody that's from creation of the data to processing knows what to do, has the right data structuring, understands what's going to happen with it. And only if I then get the data as an analyst for business model or whatever, I know I can trust the data, I can base my decision making on it. So um, for me, what can companies do? Well, create a data culture in your company and that everybody understands and doesn't fear data, basically. Okay, so I get we need data trust. <laughs> Christoph, what's your opinion? I, I find that really interesting, your approach about like a culture of data. And I think we in our department have such a culture. And what I found really interesting as well is what you just said, uh, said Bernd, because the processes that you showed us looking so easy to set up, but I can tell you they're not. <laughs> and that is <clears throat> because 30 years ago, as the most majority of our components have been created, nobody took care about data structure, right? And all the fields were called like CN35XL, I don't know. Um, and nobody knew about what is in there except the one business expert that has never time for a call. And therefore, for me, it's really important to lower the barriers to understand the data. So first of all, I mean, it starts with having everything in English. Um, it sounds really weird to a lot of from you, I, I think, but for a bank that has been established for 150 years in Germany, it's really a challenge. And during the first years, it's really been a challenge with the colleagues who have never described anything in English, right? So that was something we did. And of course, self-explaining field description is something that we have to take care of so that this one business expert who has never time is not required because you just can look up the, in the documentation on the, our developer portal what's in the API. Thanks, Christoph. That's also one of my favorite points, make it understandable. <laughs> that helps everybody a lot. And do you have something to add there? Probably two thoughts coming to my mind when you were talking about the 
we're not understanding where that data comes from or what that data goes. That's something I also discuss, especially with banks very often. So we, we have, I mean, we, we have all these regulations and compliance, so we are able to dig out the right data at the right point in time, but we have to do it as an effort when somebody asks. And when we were drilling into that, it was very often like, really the understanding is missing where the data really is created where the data is used or what data do I depend on in order to do a certain service and that's again I'm biased on that but I'm very much the process view of the world can help because you understand okay there there are these couple of steps they produce that data they need that data and um, that also helps to understand I think the data ecosystem that's the one thing and the other thing is like especially if you look in the history of banking I mean being one of the early adopters of IT technology in a way, being very, very innovative in the early days because it was all information driven is batch and mainframes were embraced quite a quite big time. And I think that's what, what banks now suffer from in a way, because that's set the mindset in a way, saying, okay, we have that, we have that data here, we have that batch job there. It probably produce, produces some new data in some weird encrypted field names and because you can only be eight characters long and whatever. And really getting over this kind of thinking and getting into kind of a thinking, okay, we it's not a series of batch jobs producing weird data. No, it's in the end I want to run that process and it it, it needs to talk to serve several like services or components or apis or whatever it is it's a very different way of thinking and i think that's pretty hard to get there and and i think especially what you said about this know what data are coming from where right i mean when you have this endless importer exporter importer exporter importer exporter uh, lines i mean that is like you don't understand what data exactly you are taking for your process um and that is what you have to be absolutely clear about and being responsible as well for Kafka technology for event streaming makes it that easier because we can open up like the host, we can free up the host, the mainframe, and make that data available directly from where they're coming from without all this importers, exporters, importers, export, exporters processes. Um, and that is really helpful to see where are the data coming from and to get the control about the data. I think that is one of the main purposes uh, from our side. Thank you guys for these answers. I have a second question for you, of course. We're not done yet. Um, we already touched the subject with data trust and um, understanding the data. So from your point of view, what are the biggest challenges and biggest threats regarding data and data management? I'll wait for a second who will speak first, otherwise I will name one. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I can start, right? I mean. We just talked about that, right? For a, lo a long time, banks trusted on mainframe and batch transfers, so file transfers, and I think that is something that has changed, even though those systems are there, right? I mean, so and I think that is one of our biggest challenges to connect all those different technologies, products, platforms, I don't know, together and bring out something that adds value to the process. And I think that's for us the biggest challenge. So maybe in another perspective, I would also say that we want to create all those APIs for, for using the data. Actually, everybody in the company should become a data analyst and a data creator. That creates a lot of problems because at one point we will have in the future, you know, we might not know who is all accessing the data, what's happening there. So that's why the flow control is so important to set up a data strategy, to know your AP, APIs, to, to really control them also. And it's very easy by changing services and also the digital environment um, that you lose that. You know, for example, data analysts, you know, get headhunted from somebody else. You get a new one and suddenly a couple of lines of codes, you know, just lying there if you're not managed well. So um, I think this is a threat of like always, you know, having complete control and keep it within your company as a core competency. Happy to add one thought. Um, it's... It's going in a little bit of a different direction, but um, what always comes to my mind, I'm, I'm more from the technical side, so I'm more looking at it from the IT side. And one of the things that I think are discussed very much at the moment is the whole, like, do I centralize stuff, do I decentralize stuff? And for data, that has a very um, specific, yeah, kind of nature, because especially coming from a mainframe, for example, you can probably come from a mindset where a lot of data is connected and you have it centralized. and there were a lot of attempts in the last 10 years 
then also centralized like data structure or data management providing probably like this is how a customer looks like within the whole bank and stuff and like especially in it a lot of people understood over the last years that this doesn't work that well and that probably you have a lot of different domains also within a bank for example or other organizations where within that domain everybody has a different view on a customer for example like what is important is the address important is the bank account important is the score or the whatever important so it's a very different view on the same entity like a customer and i think understanding this and also applying that to like the system and the data management means you, you do that much more decentralized like you probably have that team or that service over there caring about data in like the customer in that scenario and this is again a very different mindset people have to get into that and it also comes with new challenges because you don't have that integrated like what's a customer view out of the box there um, but i find that very important to um, to keep some level of agility, to keep some level of, I can still touch stuff, to keep some level of, okay, this team can really understand what it does because it only touches their stuff and not the stuff everybody is like messing with, around with. I think this is super important because um, also it comes to the next step, uh, inter-organizational data collaboration. If, if, you, if you want to touch that field, which will happen to us all in the future, every bank at one point has probably a startup incubator program, I assume so we already have yeah exactly and and you probably have seen that if you get like startups like Camunda coming in and then they want data you know you have the first breach of like how do you handle that how to get give access who is doing what yeah I mean that's for sure right I mean like Jörg's had on on his intro um, API security first right I mean we are a bank that is what people trust in right I mean for 150 years our business model model was to be just closed and now everybody expects us to be open but secure. So that, that takes a while, of course, um, but we are working on that and I think quite successfully. So we have first partnerships, for example, with Smava, um, who's the FinTech and we had, uh, they participated, I think, in our first summit. So, um, but of course, to get control about who is accessing what data and taking care of GDPR and so on and so forth, this is super important, especially for banks. Thank you, guys. You don't even need me. I don't have to say anything. <laughs> um, okay, I have a last question before we come to the audience question. So if you not have any questions, you can already think about them. The last question is, what are your key learnings and best practices? Just real quick, give us two or three. Okay, I can start. It's, it's a pretty generic one, and I apply that to orchestration. Um, <laughs> and to data management, I think, but it's, it's always um, Think big, start small. I think that's one of the most important things. Always like, you, of course, you have to have a vision in mind and it would be good if you can formulate it, but don't start with the, now we have to do that company-wide, whatever data structure thingy first, or in, in, in my domain is very often, we have to do a process landscape. We have to discover all the processes and prioritize them. It's like what a lot of banks went through, I think 10 years ago, and it's, it doesn't deliver value. Like, of course you can think about like what's important process to automate, but then just do it, get going. Um, maybe not the biggest one first, a reasonable size, um, should solve a pain and so on and so forth, but then get going and, okay, so and, and do something. Think big, start small. Yeah. Eric? Um, well, in our, in our case, it's that most of our customers says, um, we work, our data specialists and also the data structuring, they work together with market people and uh, the HR people just from the get-go. So not, not everybody has to be a data specialist, but from the get-go, we want to create an understanding between these cultures. And um, this usually helps also to lift completely new ideas for business models, which we maybe later discuss. Perfect. Christoph, any last words? Yeah, I mean, famous last words, right? So no, uh, I think um, what is really crucial is to be very careful about the data design. And that's really hard work. Um, and we really invest a lot of effort into that. Um, but it's worth it. Because from my perspective, when we, for example, talk about what is a person, um, we invested a lot of effort in that and thoughts. And now we see and that is really cool thing that those APIs are reused more than 100 times company, inter company internal. So, and that is really the value of a good data design and to think of, oh, what would happen if an 18-year-old developer from Singapore would develop against it? 
So from a, the very first moment, think within the API design about the external view so that you don't have this work to do when you want to go external with the APIs. Can I add one thought? Okay, <laughs> just because it's you. <laughs> no, but it's it's kind of a follow up on that because that, that um, I normally, if I have three key points, my first is like start, um, start small and the last is like endurance in a way, like it takes time. And I think that's what you're saying. It's like, um, because in the beginning, I think that might be annoying to a lot of people to discuss the person for probably month even. On I annoyed a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. And it only pays off in the longer run and then probably for the next project. And I think you, you have to have that endurance. It's not a quick win, very often not. You can have quick wins in the beginning. It's also important, but I think um, the, the big value shows off if you, if you keep going for, for a steady, steady pace for a while. Okay, perfect. So now we come to the, um, at least for me, also surprising part. We have questions from the audience. Um, so the first one would be having mainframe data and applications with overnight processing in the bank. How can we speed up processes and do real-time processing over APIs? So that is a question for me. Uh, thank you for that. Um, of course, I mean, that is a question we had to solve as well. So we had one team that created web services, RESTful web services against the mainframe. That was really hard work, but they used to create web services against the mainframe for years. So they already knew all the guys and just came up with this new RESTful principle. Um, and the second thing is how can we speed it up and uh, get rid of the overnight processing? I think that will take years or decades, right? So, um, but what you can do is you could offload the mainframe into a Kafka stream and then make this available to all the consumers that are interested, for example, into accounts data. Um, and Kafka is a very efficient technology that allows you when you are, for example, the tax system to just listen for updates that are relevant for the tax system. And I think that could speed up a lot of things and that is, is what we're doing. Anything to add from you guys? Dan, <laughs> you're looking at me. Okay, go on. <laughs> no, but I just wanted to back that. So that's what we're seeing as well. I'm, I saw that more in the insurance industry, but the same problem. The mainframe and there, what they do is um, data change capture. So every change in the mainframe goes into an event that can be captured by an application and then they can like directly answer 24 seven in the web. Um, and I think that's pretty powerful because the, the, the one challenge you have to do in order to really process faster is you have to cut off certain connections in the mainframe to cut off certain batches where nobody really knows how they are connected. So um, it definitely takes a while. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. How does Commerzbank use data to generate real customer value? I think that's for you, Eric, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's again for me. So what are, you, are we doing a lot of things, right? So. One point that uh, you just mentioned in your presentation, Bernd, is we integrate third parties into our processes. For example, ID Now, which makes all the onboarding process easier. Or we are offering an API for corporate clients, and one of our corporate clients is an Agirebot. It's a startup from an uh, energy company, and what they did is really... We'll hear about them later, small teaser. We will hear our oh, small teaser. So they really integrated this API into... The, their customer journey, and that is really amazing how they used this access to the payment system to speed up the process to make it easier. And yeah, we will hear some details later on, I hear. We have the, in the second panel. Oh yeah, I got it. <laughs> Makes sense. All right, perfect. Now come, oh, there's another one. Uh, what could be the future role of the bank in the data game? Well, Christoph. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was more like part of my outro text, what, is, <laughs> what I'm not going to tell you. But uh, of course, I mean, when we look at banks, right, we're really well positioned in terms of access to data, right? We have a lot of interesting data, accounts data, we have payments data, and to making value to, 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 to think of what could be, gen what could value, uh, generate value to the clients, for example, when they see I don't know, there's an incoming instant payment. They can generate an instant service based on that, right? For example, for instant insurance, for, I don't know, when we have like this instant payment push notification that we are currently releasing, from, 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 from my perspective, that is something like, 
you stand and stand up, uh, you stand in front of a, a stadium where your favorite band is playing, and are searching if there are cards left, you can pay, and the ticket is directly valid, right? Because your instant payment has been received by the uh, ticket company. Instantly. So, instantly, right. <laughs> Thanks. All right, perfect. Now comes my favorite part. Is there anybody in the crowd who would like to ask a question here and who wants to see me throw this little cube? Any volunteers? Perfect. That makes it easy for me as well. So, um, you have to speak yeah. into it. Okay, so you will not see my face in this case. Hello, everyone. Uh, Jakob from uh, Big Data Advanced Analytics, Commerce Bank. Um, I have a question. I used to take part in one conference when like someone talked a lot about like having um, zealots and fun of the and, and real dedicated funds of the of the brand and how it's important. And in the at the end, someone asked in which bank you hold an account, and he ended up in some like old school bank just because it was around the corner. So it a little bit undermined the whole point. Um, and I wanted to ask a question. So. Um, Sorry, but I forgot the name, the blue hoodie. <laughs> Band. Yeah. Um, so um, do you know any like uh, established company that has like a legacy, like, uh, like a bank that has cool processes now that you could really say that is like uh, an example of like a transformation of something that, that works really, really smooth or even a bank? <laughs> even a bank. Um, there, I think there are a lot of companies where you can see that in different spots of the organization. So um, what Christoph also said there, there are very often initiatives where you say, okay, we, we get that new process um, live online and we get a customer experience that looks like everything is super smooth underneath, super digital. And then we map that to the existing legacy because it's, the legacy is there. You can just rip it out. Um, and that needs some kind of tricks. Either you copy some data or you wait till the night and don't let the customer wait for that long or whatever. And we see that in bank account opening, for example. I saw that with a couple of banks. Um, we see that in insurance a lot where also they have the same problems. Their whole core systems are, are very often super slow, but they, they provide these experiences where you can, on the mobile phone, like travel insurance, for example, do it now because my flight is leaving and you get it now. And so you see um, these examples. Very often these are kind of, starting as smaller islands in these organizations, but then they, they, they grow that, like how, how they did that, doing that to other processes. And one example, which I always find fascinating, it's, um, and it's a reference customer, so I can talk about them, it's Goldman Sachs in the US, so that's a bank. And they, they started uh, years ago, that transformation, and it's, I'm pretty sure, I'm not telling any secrets that not everything is rainbow and unicorns there, but they have a lot of these processes now much better under control, much better automated. Um, it took them a couple of years and endurance, but um, I definitely see a lot of organizations doing good movements there. Who's next? I Anyone else? It and whoever catches. Oh, the camera. Camera down. <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Profula. I'm coming from Ferris Labs. Um, my question is related to the uh, question which is already asked related to mainframes. Um, so how, how you efficiently manage the process of mainframes data? So my question is related to that part. So um, does Comex Bank is already having something like a virtualization layer using data mesh strategy where you can speed up the um, data processing? from mainframes having a virtualization data layer so that can I mean, give you a 10x speed of data uh, layer. I mean, do you already have a data mesh strategy in your commerce bank? Of course, my fear was that I would get all the mainframe questions <laughs> <laughs> um, that I cannot answer because I, I mean, that is really, of course, we have kind of an API layer around the mainframe. We start with the, uh, extracting data into Kafka system, right? But I think your question was more like super special regarding mainframe optimization itself, right? Don't of course, I think my colleagues are taking care of that, right? Uh, we have a, uh, a department taking care of all those mainframe optimizations, and I'm sure that they are doing something at like that. Um, and 
I think my specialist would know better, but in this case, sorry, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, sorry, I mean, this is not about the mainframe optimization. My, I mean, I'm just asking in terms of a data strategy. So you have the mainframes and you have uh, a centralized data house, maybe what, whatever you have. So I'm just thinking in terms of architecture, how um, you pull out this information and, and, and put it into the API. So you have a centralized data lake architecture or you have a data mesh strategy where you can have a virtualization layer before that. We have both, right? Okay. So, um, and I think it's depending on use cases to see what would make more sense, right? So in some cases, it's like you need direct access to mainframe data. So for example, read account data, right? Or that you need like data that are available in an event stream for, I don't know, account transactions or so. Um, and you need to offload some data to a data lake to make then advanced analytics based on that, right? Got it, thank you. Okay, guys, I'm sorry to be the party pooper, but we need to stop the discussion here right now um, as the time is already up and it's my job to keep the time. So otherwise, my boss will be really angry. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that there are still a lot of open questions and we can take these questions after the summit or whoever's here in the room with us can ask them. Uh, once we're done with everything, whoever is online, you can ask these questions via our developer portal. We will be happy to answer all of them. And at this point, many thanks to you guys. It was really, really interesting listening to you. Great job. Yeah. All questions, Thank but you. mainframe questions. <laughs> all questions, but mainframe questions. These will be blocked. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so this was the first part, and we now already learned that data alone is not the key to success. We need data strategy, we, we need data management to generate value from these data. And now it would be really, really interesting to get to know some business models that are based upon customer insights and customer data. And as luck would have it, we have a second keynote speaker and a second panel for you. And the topic for the second panel is creating services based on customer needs. And now I'm looking at the crowd and there's Fabian. Fabian, would you please join me here? This is Fabian yes, Demut sure. from Neosphere. And he kindly agreed to give us a short keynote. So the stage is yours and good luck. Cool, thank you very much. Yes, right. Thank you very much for the introduction and I'm very happy to be here. So I think this is one of the first presentations uh, with a real audience. So really excited and um, just to figure out how that works here. But um, yeah, right. All right. Perfect. Um, today, I'm very happy to explain you a little bit more about how we create services based on customer needs. And you see buzzword after buzzword. So um, you better also can say today, um, how we can save the planet with APIs. I know that's a big headline, but I will explain what I mean. And um, first of all, I want to just to ask the audience, um, who of you already knows Neosphere or what we do? So just give me a short hand sign because, all right, that's good because I have just 10 minutes and I really want to get quick to the interesting points. So just a short introduction. Um, we are basically the R&D unit of Commerzbank and also the early stage investor and our uh, main goals are to accelerate the digital as well as the sustainable transformation. And maybe some of you will know us as main incubators. So we had a rebranding earlier this year. Now we are Neosphere and we are split it in three units. And at the Invest unit, we are investing in startups with a strategic focus. So that means that we can also implement the technology in our group or on our customer side. At the build team, we are discovering future technologies from AI to quantum computing and they're building also new prototypes and set up new venture cases. And at the last part here, Connect, um, there we bring together the thought leaders of different future topics. Um, and as well, you will find our Between the Topics series as well as the Impact Festival. And here's a short overview about our investment portfolio. So here you can see in which uh, startups we already invested. And I'm really happy also here to see Stock Republic. Uh, later we see uh, also Fabian in the panel together. So I'm happy to meet you here today. And yeah, 
Now, just a short overview also in the build area, what we're doing beside our next topic, what I'm going to explain. So here you can see the Lissy wallet app. It's all about self sovereign identity management. It's basically an application where you are the boss of your data, so you can decide which data, um, when and to whom and why you provide these. And so quite exciting. And on the right side, you can see everything around Web 3.0. And here we are discovering several solutions and opportunities uh, in the blockchain area, also in the metaverse, what could be interesting for a traditional bank to jump on in the next years. And we already have here for a, a launch in the metaverse. So if you're not already connected anymore to the real world, you can find us over there and get in contact. OK, now I'm come, I come to the topic I want to talk about today. It's called Impact Solutions Platform, and it's all about to accelerate the green transformation in companies and corporates. And to give a short insight how we, how we think about customer needs or pain points before we starting any MVPs. So it's quite simple. We check out data and statistics, and we have a concrete look about uh, what are the challenges of small companies, of large companies, and uh, trying to creating values um, due to that we have a really strong focus on the challenges of the companies today. And everything marked yellow here you can see is related to sustainability. So from the strategy to the transformation about resources, um, CO2 emissions, mobility, energy, and so on, um, taxonomy stuff. So here you see beside the pandemic, nearly all challenges are related to sustainability. And that was the reason why we said we have to um, do here a stronger focus and think about how can we support our B2B customers in these challenges. And so from our perspective, we're in the startup market, we have uh, got built up the Impact Festival, so we see so many solutions on the market, software solutions, hardware solutions, new materials. So um, yeah, to check out how, how can we connect these um, challenges with our solutions, we uh, went deeper into the details of course, we verified everything. We talked to companies. Um, how, how about your status quo at the moment? Uh, what could be interesting for you? And then we come to the final conclusion. We need a platform, a marketplace, where we connect the supply and demand. So there are so many solutions and so many companies who want or have to transform. And here you can see. So um, it's already or nearly, nearly finished. We're working here the last month with our software developers together to build up a platform where you can go on to. And um, with several options, you can browse as a head of sustainability, transformation manager, or CEO um, to find about perfect solutions, new technologies, new startups um, discovered from us. Uh, you can categorize yourself with a quiz. You can see here. Uh, you can compare everything and then you can go into details, see if you fit in the target group, go more into details about uh, concrete prices. You can see everything you need to jump on and directly um, contact the provider. As well as we have for special conditions, so also here a financial benefit for our customers. That is what the customer sees, now I'm going to uh, behind the platform, so how the platform is set up, how we work together with the uh, Commerce Bank here, and how do we use API in this case. So we, like an external provider, we're building up the platform, and the first API comes through our white label platform. So here for we um, set up this product, and then Commerce Bank can go to their customers, via digital channels, uh, via one-to-one -one meetings to nearly to uh, half a million B2B clients facing the uh, sustainable transformation. Hey, we've got here a solution and um, jump on. And then they can um, go for security reasons um, here through the Commerce Bank Data Universe to verify themselves. And here over the API to make this easier in the onboarding to use already existing data they provided and to make this even quicker and more comfortable. So yeah, here you see the uh, basis setup of how we use API and how we work together and how we try to support customers uh, on a concrete example at their challenges. Um, now about our challenges uh, to set up APIs and such a platform. 
So uh, yeah, here yeah, I forgot. Um, sorry for that. The business model for sure. Um, anybody has to pay, um, but it's very fair. So there are no fixed costs at all for anybody. We have here um, a partnership uh, agreement, so we get revenue uh, revenue split share about every new created business over the platform. Now to our challenges. So um, of course, when we work together with multiple parties. Um, Data protection is a huge topic we have to uh, take care about, um, as well as all connecting processes beside the API and the platform. So that's quite from top management up to all operational units. A lot of meetings uh, not to underestimate to make sure also about uh, liability and reputation. We are here in uh, a white label model, so we have to be really clear who takes responsibility for what, um, checking all due diligence processes, and with all um, touch units from marketing, uh, risk assessments, and so on, um, that everybody is um, on board and that the rollout can be done successfully. Of course, last point, you need new business models. So we have here um, a new value, a new service. Uh, we need to monetize and, but yeah, as well, this is the best point also to hand over to um, the opportunities. So which direction? the point oh, it was too far <laughs> all right um, yeah also the one of the greatest opportunities that we are able to create new business models and especially when it comes to open banking um, from my perspective the most interesting part to generate new revenue streams with a existing setup and to use our reach and of course yeah building new customer value new customer services and especially also um, unique value creation when it comes together with several parties. You've got um, more data you can combine. And then with these uh, new data sets, again, building new um, added values. I will explain in a minute what I mean exactly. And of course, um, yeah, here comes together when you uh, collaborate with new partnerships and external parties. That's the most interesting part we come. Now we come to the outlook. So what's in our long-term backlog, what's possible, where we can use more APIs, more added values, and even more revenue streams. So we can see here the setup from the slides um, before, but uh, with one interesting feature added. So you can see here is reporting. It's like an uh, obligatory process in the future. Every company has to report. And at the moment it's um, going over um, PDFs. So uh, digital more easier for the customer, more easier for commerce bank, and then we can use the data and um, do some more stuff. We can offering peer group reviews, we can offering advanced matchmaking features. And if, if you have to report something, you have to um, create data to report. And <laughs> then it makes very sensible to also integrate a tool that um, you can be sure that this is the right tool. There's so many carbon accounting tools on the market, and then you have to extract the data and then send to the reports. So that what makes very uh, much sense here to combine these all on one platform. So the customers have here everything related to sustainability at one point, and we can work with the data as well. And if you have a carbon accounting tool, of course, what follows next? You have to um, buy carbon credits. So you have to be uh, carbon friendly in the future. Um, and then you can see there are more options to work together with external supplies, but integrate this in the Commerce Bank universe directly accessible for um, the customers. And then can be sh they can be also sure here with the credits. There are so many new companies, so many different credits around the globe, how you can um, compensate uh, or offset your carbon emissions and this is really hard to find the perfect quality, the right credits you need to report. And here you have got the trust behind in the bank. And um, this is our opinion, how we can really create uh, added value for our customers and tackle real challenges. <clears throat> and if we have a look in the other direction, there are also new or other possibilities, for example, to open our database and our sales conditions. So we have here, um, already contacted more than 400 um, providers and set up sales conditions with them. And we are already in talk with also external parties or, for example, consultancies that they can jump on 
on our platform via an API and use our um, existing agreements. And again, also for us to create new revenue streams over um, a revenue split. All right, yes, there was my input about um, the bigger picture and I'm really looking forward how far we can get and how to realize everything. And um, that seems really cool what we, um, can, what we can do here in the future and um, especially with so many different APIs and external partners. And um, yeah, afterwards, very happy to jump on with my colleagues to discuss further. And um, yeah, that's so far for the impact solutions platform yeah sure here sorry i forgot that we can see um how many um challenges we've seen here in the statistics we would support so um i would say we can definitely make here um yeah uh, good customer values and support them with uh, real problems um one last point i have an uh, a little gift for you so next week the impact festival takes place again so i'm uh, really honored that i could set up this festival yeah last year with um, my great colleagues at neosphere and um, next week it's going into the second edition and also for everybody who's interested in sustainable innovations or technologies there are again over 170 exhibitors from all over europe and um, also software, hardware, material solutions, and happy to see you there. And now I've got the sign, we have to jump on the panel. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Many thanks, Fabian, for your insights. Um, super exciting to see that Neosphere is so enthusiastically supporting sustainability. That's really great, happy. Um, that someone's here on track. And thanks again Thank for you. my speakers here, who I will now introduce. So um, on the one hand, we have Annika Bremen kaitas I hope I pronounced it correctly, who is product manager at Energierevolte. Christoph already mentioned it um, in the first panel. Um, and I, yeah, exactly. And on the other hand, we have Fabian Grafengieser, co-founder and CEO of Stock Republic. Um, originally, we had Max Knopf as, an, as a panelist, but as his daughter has been recently born, Fabian luckily agreed to step in. So thanks a lot. And once again to you and your new family, Max, congratulations. I hope everything is great. So I suggest that we get started. This is going to be fun now with two Fabians here. So um, I'm going to try to make it as obvious as I can. Um, so Fabian Demut, <laughs> you already told us there are some challenges and opportunities when talking about APIs and platforms and API-based services. But I was wondering if we should start at the beginning, looking at the way how we can get from data to customer services. So my first question would be, how do you get from just collecting data to generating customer value services? Fabian, Annika, any of you want to go Anyone. first? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can start if you want. Yes, uh, gladly. Uh, I'm, I'm having a very sort of down-to-earth approach to this, okay? Uh, I used to work at the Swedish bank. I was head of the Internet Office for Retail at SEB, is the name of the Swedish bank. Uh, and we had a very sort of concrete problem here when it comes to investment, savings, pensions, and stuff like that. And that was my problem. That was my headache, okay? How do we get our customers online to execute, to buy their pensions or mutual funds or other things online? Uh, we did a lot of things with product offerings, pricing, accounts, and so on, but we still had problems with that. And why was it? Uh, what we discovered was it was mostly a psychological problem. People were hesitating. Hey, should I buy this uh, stock or this mutual fund for my pension today? Or, hey, what about the market? Maybe next week. This is terrible now. I don't know. I need some, someone to hold my hand. And who's going to hold your hand? Normally the bank, right? As you, it's your bank. So how does the bank hold your hand here? They say, Fabian, come to a meeting on Thursday at 11 o'clock. So I have to go from my work and so on, and I can go. And that's, that's a fair solution. Can work sometimes. But is it an online solution? No. So. What we, what we did was looked into the database of the customers we had, about 1 million customers doing investments, and saw that some of them, about 10, 15%, of, if you look at them over time, are really good in taking care of their investments. 
So this is great information for me. If you're talking about data and information, this is data within the bank, not used. I'm a customer. I want to see what the best investors are doing right now uh, in real time. They don't want to sell me anything. They're taking very reasonable risks because it's their own money. That kind of data sits within the bank, not used. Okay. So that was the starting point for what we do, I would say. And once it's simple use case, how can we use that data for the end users, the customers? Super interesting. Thanks for these insights. It's great to see that, yeah, a simple psychological problem can be solved by simply analyzing the data you have. Annika, what is your intake on that? Yeah, question? just like uh, Fabian, we kind of uh, came from the customer's problem. We realized that there are a lot of customers that um, have problems paying their electricity and um, that this was not always due to the fact that um, they could just not pay for it, but that they often lack the transparency, like how much of electricity do I actually use or um, and that um, also the pay payment itself was a problem. In Germany, it's very usual that you uh, pay monthly installments for your electricity. But um, there are people that are not able to pay 150 euros at once, but they would rather be able to pay 50 euros at the beginning of the month, 50 in the middle and um, 50 at the end of the month. And once we recognized that, uh, we were searching for a solution and um, when we found the solution in our prepaid electricity um, offer, uh, we at the same time recognized um, that a lot of other data comes with it that we can actually um, use in order to create even more transparency for the customer by, for example, showing them on even on a daily basis how much electricity they consume. And um, by that also to set um, yeah, some some nudges um, to to save electricity, and um, it's meanwhile actually scientifically proven that if you um, if you deal a lot with your uh, energy consumption, that uh, you get more aware of it, and that you can also save a lot of electricity, which is also quite important when we look at the winter yet to come. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so Fabian Demut, <laughs> what's your intake on that? Uh, yeah, I think it's um, quite important to, to think about how we can use data. I think often mm, there are missing capacities or you haven't got the right ideas how to monetize. So um, I think it's important to, to, to work here also with other partners or um, innovative startups like these um, with an external view, with new ideas and um, also the capacity to realize this. Yeah. Perfect. That actually quite, uh, fits quite well to our first panel when we learned that we need to know about the data and we need to understand the data and then we can fix the problems you just mentioned. <laughs> um, this brings me to my second questions. I mean, we've heard a lot from Fabian about his business model and Neosphere and the Impact Festival and the Impact Platform. But I was wondering if you two could give us a short introduction to what you are actually doing and how you're using the data. So for everybody who isn't super familiar with what Stock Republic and Energie Revolte is doing, maybe a short recap for everybody who's here in the room or behind the screens. Sure. Should I start? If you want. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> no, but uh, what, what we're doing, I mean, it's very connected to what I mentioned earlier here. How do we visualize the data within your bank from people who are doing good investments and who are not doing good investments? Who are, how can we do this comparison online, uh, real time? Uh, so. Give, if you think of the bank, if you're an end user, a customer at the bank, the bank is a black box. What's happening in the bank? You don't have a clue, okay? But what we do is turning the bank into a white box for the customer. Okay, this is what I do, and this is what everybody else is doing right now. So what I'm doing, is that good? I don't know, compared to you. But now I can see it, okay. No, it's less good than you, or it's better than you, fine, or it's better than average, or better than the best, and so on. So that's the kind of comparison we do, and that's what sort of our data model. And the other part of that is what you can, you, what you can call social media, communication. I want to communicate with you, start a group with you, or my family, follow you, what you're doing in real time when it comes to investment or savings. So we have the data part, which is comparison and benchmark, 
and the social part, which is communication. And that's pretty interesting also for the customer that we sell to, which is banks. Because if you have that data, you can be very precise in communicating with your customers. And let's call it upsell <laughs> is, is, is one way of putting it. So if we know exactly who maybe has more cash than average in their portfolio right now, we can communicate that, say, hey, maybe you should do something. The best are not having that kind of cash in their portfolio right now, or a million of other topics and, and use cases like that. But so basically that's what we do. Sounds great. Sounds like you're really taking the fear from people and that's something I really appreciate, especially in terms of financial data, which a lot of people don't like putting too much thought into it because it's something that scares them often. Okay, Annika, moving on to you. How do you generate true customer value? Yeah, so talking about the fear, I think that's something um, that a lot of people uh, these days experience when they think about the end of the year when they will get uh, their um, electricity bill. So we want to take away this fear from you by um, giving you the opportunity to, um, on the one hand, of course, buy your electricity in advance, but um, we don't think about that you just sit down and um, buy your electricity in advance for a year, but it's rather the idea that you buy it in small portions, um, by that um, you have um, uh, you have the opportunity to actually monitor how much you are using and um, to get more acquainted with your energy uh, consumption and um, also find out how much and where you can save. So if um, we use an app or we create an app actually that shows our customer um, how much electricity they are uh, consuming they can also buy electricity in um, very small amounts, like if they have only five euros, they can buy electricity for five euros. And, um, and then they can, um, they can see how, how much they use. So um, if I get up in the morning, for example, I start a hair dryer, I will see a peak in my app. And um, if at the end of the day I see, okay, today I consumed something like one euro thirty, I can go through the day and I can check out and see where I could have maybe saved something. Um, yeah, by that we're making electricity consumption um, much more transparent and um, yeah, also more planable because um, due to the fact that you pay for the electricity in advance, at the end of the year you will get a bill, but it will actually just sum up all the buys you have been doing during the year and you will not have to pay anything anymore. Okay, so it's again a lot about transparency and making yeah, the data you actually have also visible for your customers. Exactly. Of course, what also interests us as, as a bank, so what would you suggest? How can we support you? How can we make your life easier? Where do you see a basis for, for example, a cooperation between your, your business and ours, where do you see we could we could connect or what would you wish from, from your bank um, further, su further support? Maybe I will start with Fabian <laughs> on your side. Um, yeah, I have to think about it because we're very close to the bank and they're working uh, quite successful um, together. So at the moment, uh, so I have, I have no wish uh, how we, well, we uh, like could to hear more, that. Uh, intensify and uh, yeah, we had a, we have a great exchange and I think this is um, also um, a, su a successful setup to to be a little bit more outside of the bank to have the opportunity to think uh, with risks, uh, completely new ideas, and then to figure out if we can implement and to exchange with the colleagues and uh, to then yeah, if if it works, to to give new features new business models um, like the platform. Also, we have a lot of other investments we um, did and then integrated into the portfolio or the customers like building efficiency or APIs for the logistics sector to track better emissions and so on. So uh, yeah, I think that works quite well and uh, we have to more focus on and intensify. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to make the question a little bit easier because I said, okay, where can we as Commerzbank help? I'm not only talking about us as a bank, but in general, where do you can, where do you think banks can step in and be a strong partner at your side? Not only Commerzbank, but banks in general, because I mean, we have a lot of data all about our customers, which we of course do not want to publicly share, but we could use. So Annika, maybe from your side. 
Well, in fact, we're already working together in a quite um, a helpful way because uh, we're receiving, um, like it was mentioned before, we're already using the API and um, that helps us um, uh, to, to see the payments of our customers actually in real time and um, to book them faster so um, that uh, they, they can uh, consume their electricity also in time. Um, but uh, yeah, there are of course um, always uh, possibilities. Um, what uh, what else would uh, that that could improve the customer experience? Uh, something that we're thinking about for a really long time, and that we would also wish for at some point is that you could, for example, um, just go to um, to any um, EC uh, machine and uh, and charge your prepaid electricity account through it. That would be something that would be thinkable. All right, interesting. Fabian, any more suggestions from your side? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is the core of what we do. We actually sell software and solutions to banks and brokers. So, so for sure. But I mean, what is that kind of data that we are interested in here? It's basically your data, okay, or mine. It's just sort of being uh, holded by the bank, if you want to put it that way. And that's the direction we see in open banking and so on. It's not the bank's data. It's your data. Uh, the bank is just holding it for you and it will be more accessible and transparent. That's the route we're on, okay, whether we like it or not. So, I mean, what can the, uh, the I, in my perspective here, the banks shouldn't be the victims here, just only holding out the data because of regulations or something like that. No, Do okay. something good with it. And that's what we hope actors like us can do. So, I mean, uh, Bernd, uh, the first speaker, he, he mentioned data as oil. Maybe you should call it something else than oil today, I don't know. But let's call it fuel or something like that. Uh, uh, and, and the banks and the brokerage and so on, they are sitting on this energy, the fuel that fuels machines like ours and a lot of others. So, I mean, it's a necessity to get these kind of machines rolling with that kind of data. So that's definitely a, a super important thing. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's the customer's data and not the banks. <laughs> We're just safeguards. <laughs> okay, so are there any questions either from Slido or uh, from the audience here? I'm just having a look at the back. Are there, is there anyone? On this, ah, there's something on the screen. Okay, um, how to encourage building more partnerships based on APIs and open banking in the financial industry? Who's up for that one? So it's either either a Fabian or Annika. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> I actually have to read the question again. It's very long. And we're not in the financial industry, really. <laughs> I really don't know how to answer this. <laughs> All right, then maybe I, I'll hand it over. Fabian? Yeah, yeah, I can try. Um, I think we're on a good track. So uh, I think what, what encourage uh, this more is to, to go more in, in, in deeper exchange. What are um, four possibilities here? And I think the data is already there. We have to take care to collect the data, the precise, and um, then uh, f to clarify how to use. And I think there are also um, not low huddles. If you also, I think, on the financial big data cluster, though, there is happening a lot, but it's also not easy on the on the other hand side. So we um, experienced it in several other projects to to handle the data over more parties and to get really um, insightful views that you can um, uh, create new values with with the data as well. So I think yeah, both sides there are quite uh, challenges to solve. Also maybe regul in on the regu regulatory side, and um, as well there's a lot of potential. So I think uh, yeah, we have to go into exchange and talk to each other. So pros for better communication. Yeah, maybe I can add on yeah, to that. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I come from this world. I used to sit in the bank taking these decisions, okay? Uh, and there was no, no, no third-party solutions. We will build ourselves. Okay, Th this was a while ago, but it still exists. 
And I think we have to sort of move away from that, from the bank side. Uh, and this is what encourages uh, entrepreneurs, uh, new startups or whatever. Uh, if banks would let in third party providers and what, what's the reason for that? I mean, the reason shouldn't be to encourage startups. The reason should be, hey, because we can actually provide better services for our end customers, okay? Because we cannot build all these services ourselves. We're super good at some core business, banking business, right? The bread and butter. But what's the topping here? Uh, the topping is probably from third parties uh, providers uh, because that's their niche. So make it easy for them, maybe in business models, revenue sharing, uh, APIs, and so on. So that would be my guess. I think that's uh, the part where I can pitch in now because this is not only valid for the banking sector but also for the energy sector. I see so many energy companies that um, just don't uh, profit as much of uh, third providers as they could and I think it's important for actually oil sectors to look around and to find the people who are experts in their field and connect with them so that we can join the knowledge that we have to create the best product for the customer. Yeah, I totally agree. And also from what you're saying, that sounds like there also has to be a shift in culture also internally and externally because everybody has to wrap their heads around opening up. And, and I think there is. There yeah. is a shift in culture. Oh, definitely. I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here today <laughs> if there wasn't be. <laughs> All right. I think we have a new question. Um, talking about new and challenging ideas, time-consuming changes in mindset and architecture and economically economically changing challenging times how shall a bank proceed okay this is a tough one as none of the panelists is actually from a bank so <laughs> but i guess we could just say banks should be open maybe also to the ideas of companies that approach them um, in order to develop something or uh, something like services um, or provide services that actually help those companies um, to uh, create great services for their customers. Anything to add, Fabians? Here, here. <laughs> All yeah, right. Uh, maybe um, just one uh, addition. For sure, to be uh, quite. A lot of more faster in this area and uh, that also needs to as we had uh, talked about the cultural change to be more open for for new changes uh, maybe also complete complete new models um, or ways how we can partner with um, external partners and uh, to be open for external um, providers so i think this is a really important story to um, to give the opportunity to others which are thinking faster or can develop this better um, to to really go here um, yeah, together this way. No, totally sure. agree. And I mean, there's a fierce competition out there. Uh, everybody want to eat some pie, piece of this banking pie, right? Could be more to this, could be investments, could be something else. So, I mean, if I were a bank, I would be pretty scared of, of sort of, we, we need to innovate and be fast, either ourselves or through partners. So. Yes, definitely. All right. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so I'm Niels Brandt from Fraunhofer Institute of, of Experimental Software Engineering, and I've got a question to uh, Energie Revolta. So we are talking about customer value generating services, and I think having fun is actually not to neglect uh, using, using services, apps, and stuff like that. Um, do you have considered uh, using uh, gamification aspects uh, at Energy Revolve? Oh, you're, you're nodding. Uh, <laughs> that's a good sign because I have a, a ton of, uh, maybe I think a ton of ideas because it, it sounds like fun saving energy and not only showing a dashboard, which, which is also kind of fun, but I think about rewards and stuff. And maybe I hand, you, hand it over to you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we've actually um, just talked about this uh, before this panel um, <laughs> that uh, okay. that uh, it would be maybe a great thing if you could just connect with your neighbor and um, you could uh, kind of get into some uh, energy saving challenge. 
we have had a lot of ideas like this in the past. Up to now, we have been very busy with um, building up um, our product, but I think in the future, we're very open for new approaches in this direction to make energy saving also fun. Yes, because I think APIs are really helping boosting um, stuff like that. And, you know, fun is really not neglectable. So, <laughs> but thanks for your answer. This is also a great question for the little get together after the event. So maybe room for more discussions. Any questions from the crowd? Niels, would you throw. please throw it? It would it would save me a lot of stress. <laughs> okay, just uh, for you for the, you as a third uh, party provider. So how would you um, like to being approached from from banks in the future in terms of pro them providing their API to you as a service? Would that be someone calling from the bank and, and explaining the, the APIs that they offer for third parties? Or would that be, I don't know, a marketplace where you could connect to? What would be, like, from, from a third party perspective, the best way to approach you if I was a bank and want to, you know, offer you my API services? Shall I answer that? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I'll, I have not a super clever answer to that, but I mean, there are today different kind of sandbox environments and stuff like that, which basically offers uh, API environment uh, to uh, certain partners or maybe everyone, depending. So I guess that would be the route to have some kind of, let's call it marketplace or sandbox where you offer maybe for free or not. That, that's another question, but that's the sort of interface between uh third party actors i would say and you can see that in in the open banking space that's basically what they do uh, so what you think is there's room for improvement to be more attractive as an ipi or is there room for improvement to offer something more publicly or do you think it's approachable already i mean the, the beauty of api is that it's pretty reusable in every situation so if there are APIs, I, I think that's maybe sufficient, at least for, for a first or second step here. Uh, I mean, in, in a dream world, we will have standardization and other things, uh, but APIs are pretty standardized, I would say. So um, I think we'll, that will help a lot. All right. Oh, that was easy. That was easy. Go ahead. Um, I have a question to the Neosphere platform. Um, we are talking about openness, we are talking about co-creation with frenemies. So do you think about opening your platform to other banks? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, due to that uh, sort of a white label and behind us build up as a venture case, we definitely are open to talk to anybody. Yeah, and for mm -hmm. sure also to make it easier in the banking sector to standard uh, to standard detail, uh, sorry, <laughs> to, to, to build a standard, uh, for example, for the ESG reporting or for um, yeah, several uh, topics here, um, all banks, banks are dealing with. And I think uh, that's uh, for sure um, important to create new partnerships and also to um, work together in one branch or in one sector. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Is there one more? I think we still have time. All right, Stephanie, would you be so kind as to throw the cube to the nice man in blue? Thanks. So I was really impressed by uh, this, how you leverage uh, human psychological factors to um, yeah, help people make better informed decisions. And I think the principle that you're using is the social comparison, right? Because we're all social beings and we compare to each other. And that really, um, as far as I understood you, helped to, to yeah, get people interested in uh, maybe changing their behavior. What else or what was perhaps some other psychological factors that you're using in that regard to, um, yeah, to drive behavioral change? Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, let's talk about climate. <laughs> Uh, maybe that's that's one uh, use case at least so we we are uh, working a lot with uh, if you're talking about esg you probably know a lot about that esg is probably pretty complicated okay so and if you talk about esg in your investments 
how is your portfolio doing with the carbon footprint? Do you know? Uh, probably not. It's pretty hard to know. But so, so that is one sort of complex thing. Uh, also super important thing. Okay, so how do we do that? If you ask people, do you want to have a climate friendly portfolio, put all your money in climate friendly investments? Basically, everyone says yes. But do they act so? No, they don't. Okay, that's that's our experience. So what we've done here is simplify that a lot. So we, we talk about only about E, the environmental thing here, climate impact. So we put a metric on every holding you have, mutual fund, stock, ETF, whatever. Uh, but we put the metric low, medium, high, like a traffic light. Pretty simple to understand, okay? If you do so, uh, you get the benchmark. This is my score. Is it better than average or worse than average? Is it better than you and so on? And then gives you a incentive to actually act. Okay, I have three things in my portfolio that are sort of not good here. Do something if you want to. And you shouldn't do that for sort of sentimental reasons. You should do that for economical reasons because this money will be lost, even whatever you think about climate, due to consumption pattern, change in patterns or regulation or something else. These are at risk. So that's our approach. Simplify it and uh, showcase that your money at uh, risk and what you can do about it straight away. Was that an answer? Yes, that was an answer. Thank you. And perhaps if I can add one more question, sure because that, that always uh, pops up when it comes to banking data, right? How did you solve uh, the, the, the privacy challenge here when it comes to uh, making that uh, black box a white one? All right, good, good question. There are, they, there are basically two things that are sensitive here. That's your identity, and that's the amount of money you have. That's sensitive for people, for legal reasons or psychological reasons. So we put away those two. Say, okay, this is an anonymized environment. You can be Donald Duck. Fine, you're choosing your name here in this environment. But it's a real person, it's a real account, it's real transactions, but we don't know who you are. We don't know your account number, social security number, name, nothing. And we don't know the amount of money you have. If you have 10 million euros or 100 euros, and it doesn't matter because we uh, all is in proportions. So if you take away those two things, then you uh, take away also a lot of the sort of compliance burden and all the things that comes with data integrity. That, that's our experience. I think this also is something for Niels and his gamification question because this also sounds a lot like comparing with your neighbor and it, it, it sounds great. All right, is there one more question? Otherwise, I think we can wrap it up. I cannot see anybody eager to ask something. Okay, so then we're at the end of this panel. So thanks again to you three for your interest, uh, for your, yeah participation for your insights, for your interest in this topic. Um, super exciting to see what you guys are working on, where you want to improve, where you see banks that um, yeah, could also improve. So I, I, I've, I've learned opening up even more. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for, all, for answering all these questions. And yeah, I think then we're almost done with the summit. So I don't want to throw you off the stage, but basically... <laughs> This also brings me to the last agenda point for this evening and thus for the summit. After two keynotes and two panel discussions, it's time for some insights from our side. So I would kindly ask Christoph again to join me here on the stage to give a strategic outlook. What is your key takeaway and what do you believe is needed to create customer value generating services? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so I think most answers I've already given in the panel. No, just kidding. So, um, I mean, when we look on data strategies, data strategies are really enabling a lot of business models, right? And are enabling a lot of opportunities. And what we just heard in the last panel, for example, is there's a really huge demand for a change in the banking culture and in the culture of 
the huge old industries, right? So from my perspective, this is something that was really, let me say, a story that I are facing every day, that we have to fight against the, uh, the old narratives, uh, because as you know, bankers stand up early and wake up very late. So maybe we have to tell them the future is now, we have to wake up. And um, so from my perspective, this is really what's all about to do the change, to be part of the change. So that I think in future we can say banking APIs are necessary, the old banking culture is not, to make a small link to a famous man, right? And uh, when I look to the insights, when you talk about, for example, data strategies in digital collaborations, I think that is a must. That would be my first key takeaway. It's really a must to think about data strategy when you think of digital collaboration. And it's related to an invest. So you have to invest people, you have to invest money, and you have to be patient and not too fast. So. And my second um, key takeaway would be that there are different approaches of data strategies out there, and some are enabling internal processes, like we heard from Bernd, and some are enabling new revenue models, like we heard here just in the panel from Fabian and um, from Annika. So I think that is really, you have to find your approach to solve what you ever want to solve, right? So technology is always only the enabler. You have to find the value by yourself. And the third thing is from banks perspective, we are well positioned because we have access to a lot of interesting data. And here we have to shift from the old thinking to a new thinking, right? So the new narrative shouldn't be like, oh, well, we shouldn't open up because all the fintechs are stealing our business models, but to say, well, while opening up, we could make a lot of business models possible for our clients. We could in, uh, innovate together with our clients like in a, in a Volte, or we could innovate or add value to our service with a vendor like Stock Republic. So, and that is, or we could easy up the process, whatever. So that is like rethinking in banking processes, in the banking culture, that is my key takeaway. And I'm quite happy that our COO supports this thinking. I mean, we heard that Jörg said, we have a data strategy, and this is super important for the corporate. And from my perspective, personally, I think all corporate should have a data strategy that is, um, is embedded in the corporate strategy. And when having that, I, I, I think that opens up a lot of possibilities in mind what could be done when huge partners work together from the home sector, from the bank sector, from the energy sector. Just thinking of what could happen if data would be open but secure. Um, and I, I, I think that is something where I can say we as Commerzbank, we are ready for partnerships. We are ready for partnering. I think that was a question. What could good bank or what could old banks do with open banking and APIs? Be ready for opening up for partnerships. Partnering is key in future to stay relevant for the client. Because it's not like that we can force the client to log into our interface, even though it's ugly because we are the bank and they can visit us in our branches Monday to Fridays from nine to eleven or even longer, I don't know. So, I mean, that is like, we have to open up to stay relevant for our client to make him happy. I mean, that's what all, what's it all about, about clients, right? And yeah, that is all what I've, as an insight from this uh, great event, I have to thank everybody who has prepared that. Uh, in my team, really, a lot of people took care of making this event possible. I have to thank, of course, the keynote speakers, Fabian and Bernd, uh, I have to thank all the panelists. Thank you for being here with us. I think it was really interesting talk, insightful. Thank to wonderful Katarina for being the host today. And of course, thank to you, to all the attendees being here around us, with us, being at home at your screen or in your company at your screen. I think this is all possible because of you. 
and your interest in that. Um, this event will be available, I think, on YouTube as a stream. So yes. yes, thank you so much. Hopefully with subtitles so that all German colleagues or, and non-English speaking colleagues can understand as well. And um, maybe we will see a lot of co uh, corporations and collaborations starting with this event, right? Perfect. Um, thank you, Christoph. You just took away my punchline because I wanted to thank everybody now. Um, so, oh, so um, sorry. Great. <laughs> No, honestly, uh, thanks for the um, outlook. I think it's super great to see that, um, well, we're on the right track, but the, there's still a lot of road ahead of us, which uh, we need to tackle. But um, I'm curious what the future will hold. So, um, okay, just from my side, real briefly, thanks to everybody who joined us here today in front of the screens and here personally. Thanks to all the panelists and speakers really great insights from your side also thanks to the team who made this year possible um yeah we we couldn't have done it without you one last thing um for everybody in the room and on the screens um we just posted here the link to our developer portal so if you're any more questions you would like to ask that we haven't been able to answer today um, you want to know anything more about APIs and API banking in Commerzbank, you want to start a collaboration, or you just want to give us feedback for the event, please only positive, I don't like negative feedback. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, we would be happy um, if you guys connect with us. Um, there's the, I'm not sure if this saying is also applicable in English, but let's roll up our sleeves and um, get started and let's start collaborating. So this is it from my side. I can only speak for myself, but this was a lot of fun. Thanks um, to you guys. I didn't have to throw the cube too often. Um, to all our guests here in Frankfurt, let's continue the discussion over some drinks and snacks to all our guests behind the screens. Um, there's nothing left to say except thank you. Stay healthy and stay curious and see you next year. <laughs>